You all know. Are we are we blind? You all know what a wonderful moment this is for us and for me I've worked for this for two years and uh, through the sponsorship of the Cultural Arts Board of the Associated Students, the School of Literature and the Department of Telecommunication and Film, we have the honor to bring you Mr. Rod Serling. We're also delighted to have with us this evening the lovely Mrs. Rod Serling. <laughs> Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be asked to give the introduction for a man who's so well known that he doesn't need any. This makes my task very pleasant and very light. But you are as much aware as I am of the more than 500 excellent television scripts he has written, of the seven books, the plays, and the numerous awards which his fellow writers have so happily given him. And so I won't need to mention that. However, I do want to say three things about Mr. Rod Serling. He is a superb technician. He knows his field, he's the master of it. I can say this without, without any fear of contradiction because I watched you as you looked at one of his films tonight and you were moved. You were enraged, you were delighted, you were at one with the character. And when a, a writer can do that, we have to admit that he's a superb technician. In addition to this, Mr. Serling is a fine artist. He has compassion, he has insight, and he has skill. He knows how to get to the heart of a character, and he knows how to prepare the fine thrust of conflict. I think we want to honor him for that. Finally, as Mr. Serling himself said yesterday, the style is the man. And when you have as fine a stylist as Mr. Serling, you know you've got a fine human being. I know I have observed him on campus yesterday. He listens to people when they talk to him. He doesn't, his eyes don't stray past their shoulders and off to the next speaker. He's listening, he's hearing you. He's truly interested in other people. He is immensely humble. He's one of the most modest men. I mean it. He is. <laughs> he is, in my experience, the most modest man to come out of Hollywood. And I think this is part of the measure of greatness, is, is true humility. And he's got the gift of laughter, and he can share your laughter. I, if you think we like him here on campus, you are right. Mr. Rod Serling. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be standing here in front of you this evening to cure a uh, desperately ravaging cold. I've been drinking vodka all afternoon. So, uh, so in point of fact, I'm just delighted to be standing at this moment, um, exposing uh, myself like this in a public lecture is a particularly difficult thing for a man like myself. Uh, number one, in response to several queries as to why I'm doing this when the bread isn't really all that good, uh, is that you may have read that I am currently unemployed. Uh, 
they took away Night Gallery, which is the only show I had currently on the air, and so I am, frankly, without work. And uh, I came to San Diego because uh, there's a marvelous uh, ocean-oriented magazine here, Oceanographic and a few others, and I have in my possession, and I'll admit this for the first time in public, a uh, picture of Jacques Cousteau, which I thought might be one of those centerfolds, because that's becoming a thing. This is a picture of Jacques Cousteau in the nude, <clears throat> sitting in 20 fathoms of water on a rock with an abalone covering his private parts. And uh, uh, <laughs> in truth, there is a special stickiness, though, when someone like myself appears in public. What the hell did I say funny then, team? Cue me later on, will you? It'll help. Uh, I spent close to 15 years, inadvertently, albeit, uh, uh, developing an image on a television screen. And I suppose you noticed that uh, apparently, at least, I look like I'm six foot one, uh, ageless, and uh, damn close to omniscient, with a kind of a grim, foreboding look of a man capable of uh, strangling small children. <laughs> and uh, delivering jeopardy-laden lines through gritted teeth like a man suffering the twin despair of lockjaw and uh, Novocaine of the upper lip. And then as fate would have it, occasions like this present me in the aging flesh, you know, five foot six and 144 pounds of solid grizzle. All this by way of a somewhat defensive preface to all of you that would acknowledge that uh, indeed I am uh, 48 years of age and I look in the immortal words of my dear and beautiful wife like an over-the-hill, aging, Sicilian, constipated prize fighter. <laughs> now as to uh, the format of this evening is I gather that I will deliver these prepared notes which will run approximately 30 minutes and then we will open it up as best we know how and as best we can in the size of a little room to a wrap to some questions and answers. Now as to what we're going to talk about this evening, uh, I'm going to offer up a pastiche, if you will, a potpourri of items generically related to the arts, television, motion pictures, the theater. I'll throw out opinions at you points of view, some of them admittedly subjective, some of them emotional, and of course you have that blessed right to disagree and to give voice to that disagreement when I'm finished. I'll argue with anyone, so long as you extend to me the privilege and the courtesy of a non-violent rebuttal. I frankly don't think there's any humor in dragging a middle-aged man off a stage with a rope. Down the, uh, down the tracks to the carbine. Now for openers, let it be acknowledged that I happen to love motion pictures. I consider myself a somewhat selective patron of this particular art form. I think further than in the past five to 10 years, I've seen more exceptionally good films than in the previous 25 years of picture going. I have some corollary uh, nitpicking criticism of the current cinema. The one thing I hate like hell to put down a buck for 10 cents worth of buttered popcorn. And when it uh, going to the movies costs a minimum five bucks for the tickets, this does in some subconscious way make me more demanding of quality on that screen, more than I uh, than in the old days, when it was rather difficult to be, to be hypercritical. That's something that only cost you dime to begin with, and also came with a double feature, two comedies, cartoon, a newsreel, bank night, bingo and sometimes free dishes. Now I'll also make this admission to you. I think your culture, the culture of your time, your age, the culture of the young and mine don't always jive. For example, when I read the other night that the Rolling Stones can pick up a cool half million dollars for one evening performance, and I look at Mickey Jaggers in his $500 Halloween costume, and I'm given to understand that uh, he and his group have become somewhat a legend with their middle ears and splitting cacophony of noise. I get a perverse feeling that perhaps I've lived too damn long. 
Now, this sense of resignation on my part is aided and abetted by my own two college daughters who look at me like I was something left over in the house by Goodwill Industries. I, think, I do think, however, that there is some mutual level of response that your generation and indeed my generation can share. We can see films like The Graduate, Patton, The Summer of 42, The Last Picture Show, and Clockwork Orange, to name just a few, and find this mutuality of response to artistic prods. For in truth, motion pictures are far more artistic than they ever were before. I think they're more honest, they're better performed, they're infinitely more courageous, they're more inventive, they're more cinematic, and more satisfying as experiences than the previous quarter century of motion picture making. And quite obviously it follows that they are far, far better reflective of what are the current mores of our time than their ancestors did. One need only look at the explicit evidence of our new sexual relaxations, which are now documented by this new cinema verite. Now, there are obviously two levels of sex on the motion picture screen. There's the garbage variety, the porno, X-rated little adventures, in which sex is all there is. No attempt to buttress up the screen with anything vaguely resembling a plot or a characterization or an advancement of the theme. Now these are the so-called mattress movies. Plain, simple, and usually uninspired. But hurriedly I interject, I would never censor the X-rated film. I wouldn't boot it out of the theater. I wouldn't rip it off its screen. I wouldn't try to padlock or to imprison the exhibitor or the house that exhibits. I don't believe that filth can be cleansed away by edict or by legal muscle. And in truth, how damaging to the moral fiber of this country is the so-called skin flick? Well, first of all, it isn't new. We think of it as innovative by way of social custom. Actually, our fathers and our grandfathers were privy to this extracurricular romancing in their day, though at the time it was a kind of a sniggering secret an eight millimeter reduction print that was bicycled from Lodge Hall to Lodge Hall for the, for the benefit of the local American Legion. It was then called a stag film, and you generally saw it entrance through a back door, surreptitiously knocking, cloaking your face, and announcing that Joe sent you. And nobody worried about moral degradation because this was a kind of a boys will be boys semi-athletic event. Uh, to, uh, to taste this particular forbidden fruit was the unspoken right of the male animal long before chauvinism and women's lib became household words. Nowadays, of course, it's a public event, these pornographic films, and you pay an awful lot of bucks to get in to look at them. Though I must admit to some serious question as to who it is that attends pornographic movies. Now, I've never parked myself on a corner with a hidden camera and recorded the nature of the clientele. It's my guess, though, that skin flicks are attended by and large and supported by ancient roues who, with trembling fingers and perspiring palms and dilated pupils, sit amidst the dark fantasy of the theater, devouring all those adventures on the screen, titillated and tantalized by the perversions that have been denied them uh, during their during their insulated lives. But I, and I repeat this, I feel no need of censorship. I do feel pity on occasion. Now the other level of sex, the explicit relationships that we see in legitimate films, and they're usually not sex for its own sake. They visually and verbally express what is truly a part of our time. Because in truth, sex is a part of our time. My concern in this regard, is not necessarily a moral one. Rather, it's almost sociological. Is sex to be an act of love or simply the right of gratification? Now, would you consider me, young friend, some kind of a tight-ass Victorian prude if I were to suggest to you that the act of love carries with it an almost inexpressible beauty, 
a passion that is mixed with tenderness, a gentleness, a mutual expression of affection and human regard. But when relegated to a zoo level of a thank you man spasm, uh, I think that beauty has been vitiated, the tenderness distorted, the essential humanness of the act cheapened and degraded so that the camera could have been set up in a barnyard. My guess is that if in truth we are offended by these grubby, scrofulous, hardcore excursions into artistic mud holes, we can best combat them by simply ignoring them. To legally wipe out pornography is an almost fruitless task anyway. Now, this is caused in part by the constantly shifting legal definition of obscenity. Currently, the New York State Penal Code, which is modeled after a recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling, requires three criteria for a work to qualify as obscene. It must, one, appeal primarily to prurient interests, two, be utterly without redeeming social value, and three, go substantially beyond community standards in portraying sexual material. Now, using this criteria, almost 90% of all the product coming out of both Europe and Hollywood would be summarily wiped off the screen, leaving behind in its wake only the son of Flubber. <laughs> uh, it's always been my feeling that censorship best be exercised at home, utilizing our, our own moral judgments, our own criteria, our own instinct for what is right and what is wrong. Self-restraint, I believe, is a much more realistic approach to the ultimate decision as to what we should see and what we shouldn't see. I mention censorship, and I repeat it, because I think its specter is, in truth, a menacing one. While it might respond to some transient ugliness that visits a neighborhood theater, it carries with it a projection of much more serious and much more damaging consequences. For as always, the question must be asked, who is to be the censor? Who is so omnisciently wise, so moral, so ethical, so right, to make clear, clean, moral judgment as to what we should see and hear and what we shouldn't? Too often, and this can be historically annotated, I believe, what begins as an outraged foray against the dirty book or the dirty movie becomes a weapon of oppression against the freedom of thought freedom of expression, the freedom of having a point of view. It begins, in truth, as a moral issue, but frequently, frequently winds up as a political one. There is in this country a strangely paradoxical view of what is right and what is wrong anyway. It evolves as a not very pleasant, selective sense of outrage that we seem to have in our country. We can scream bloody murder at enforced busing of school children but we can show little comparable emotion when the white folks in South Carolina attack a busload of eight-year-old black children in protest against busing. And this picky and choosy choice of principles applies to our national attitude as to what is clean and what is dirty. Now in the mass media, television, <clears throat> there have been overt and militant attempts to take sex off the little screen. Our rationale is that an act of love, legally sanctified or otherwise, can be very damaging to the psyche of the young. Now it's possible, on the other hand, to look at television during any given evening and see violence unfettered, unrestrained, unmuzzled. Death offered up in living color by garrot, machine gun, claymore mine, pistol whipping, blackjacking, or to the purest amongst you death barehanded. We can view in the most uninhibited fashion the 500 ways that men can wreak havoc on their fellow man. And nobody seems to worry about how much damage this can do to the psyche of the young, this violence. I submit that the young and impressionable mind might be conceivably far more damaged by seeing what comes out of a rifle barrel than by viewing what goes on in a mattress in a motel. But violence in television goes on unabated. Check off, if you will, the new shows. The new national hero is the private eye or the cop. You've got Cannon, Mannix, 
McLeod and Barnaby Jones, all lined up shoulder holster to shoulder holster. And I suppose in their infinite wisdom, network officialdom honestly believe that nightly excursions into mayhem, robbery, and homicide respond to some special audience taste. But I have this perverse disquiet that to a country already satiated, already sickened, already oversurfeited with violence and assassination and bloodletting and crime, we're far better served by a more balanced, a more reasoned, a more civilized presentation of life as it exists. If a Martian were to suddenly enter our midst, sit down of an evening in front of the little box, and view either of the three major networks as culturally expressive of what it's all about on this earth, I think he'd walk away firmly believing that the bullet is the singular instrument of political discourse, mugging is the national pastime, and violence is the hallmark of man's natural state. I don't suggest to you that we should limit television programming to Walt Disney. I do suggest that television should stop serving as simply a mirror to man's lesser instincts and occasionally try serving as a beacon light to something finer, something that carries with it a little of man's beauty, something of man's capacity for good. It's difficult. I've lost all track of the pages. But it doesn't disturb me one damn whit, honest to God, because uh, I intend to expire after this speech. This is my last uh, public thing. The voice is about to go. It's difficult, and I'll grant you this, to view television consistently and constantly and take it seriously the majority of the time. It's a medium of contradictions, as must be terribly obvious. It tries to be a display case for commercial products and at the same time an art form. It gives you Laurence Olivier playing Hamlet, and then it gives you Laurence Welk. And 15 minutes later, it offers up Arthur Godfrey hawking detergents. It occasionally tries earnestly to suggest what are the burning and consummate issues of our time, and then totally vitiates the message with 12 dancing rabbits with toilet paper. It offers you drama, music, comedy, entertainment, and in the next breath, and on the same stage out come the tides, the fabs, the axions, the teeth brighteners, the skin purifiers, the tummy mollifiers, the underarm sweeteners, the athlete feet comforters, and the whole fantasy world of the 20th century con. Learn to love me, feel the need of me, and then get the hell out and buy me. Now I suppose the very bottom line that definitively suggests the convoluted value system of American advertising on television is the fact that even the news telecasts are intruded upon with regularity with commercials, and we find somehow an equation being made between the agony of Vietnam and the heartbreak of psoriasis. But lest we be too critical of television, a doctrine of fairness would force us to be critical of television's audience as well. It happens to be a fact that the mass American viewing public is not a selective body. You can't, as H.L. Mencken adjured us, underestimate the intellect of his audience. Now, this isn't meant to be snobbish. I do think that it's a supportable thesis that in our pursuit of the good life, we've managed somehow to shove aside realities, to conjure up a time we can't live with and do so without guilt. And television has a knack for either wiping away reality or posturing it in such a way that fact and fantasy are intermingled. By the time the Star Spangled Banner plays and the screen goes to black, several million viewers walk away with glutted eyeballs and a very frazzled sense of taste and sight. Now, they witness the body count in Vietnam but at the same time, they saw the nuptials of Miss Vicky and Tiny Tim. They watched the Pope visit Yankee Stadium and the funeral of President Eisenhower. But they've also seen a classic distortion of history called Hogan's Heroes, in which the Nazis are nothing worse than bumbling, affable chubbies, whose singular crime is simply their own stupidity. And in truth, if we can believe that there was no Dachau, or no Treblinka, or no Lidice. 
or no gas oven, then it follows that perhaps there wasn't a Milai. And through the good offices of television, humanity declares itself not guilty of the atrocities visited upon itself. That's television. You go from weather statistics to sports, to the results of air pollution ratings, to war casualties. And when you hear the figure of 41,000, what the hell was that? Was that the attendance at the last New York Giant game? Or was it the number of young Americans who came home in boxes? I offer you now my own Uncle Rod's uh, critical analysis of a few television shows that I have, worse luck, been exposed to over the last couple of seasons. I don't suggest that they're symptomatic of all television, but by their presence and by their popularity, they point up, or perhaps down, what is the level of taste of a relatively large segment of the American public. Now, I would appreciate if you didn't boo or applaud or laugh or anything as I, until I finish this long line. There's a show called uh, Let's Make a Deal. Now, this is a clinical study in avarice and greed <laughs> in which perspiring yo-yos go into convulsions trying to latch onto a warehouse full of acquisitions for free, egged on by a studio audience doing a little vicarious perspiring on their own. Then I saw a show called The Dating Game, in which a vapid, mini-skirted runner-up in a beauty contest throws prepared and thinly veiled sexual questions to a trio of trick-or-treat Charlies uh, who are all obviously lusting for her body and the residual prizes that go along with her. And the whole affair, by God, pulsates with all the excitement of a Pillsbury Bake Off. Now there's a preeminently popular show that is thrown at us once a year called the Miss America Contest. Now it's damn close to being un-American to knock this show, and I'm sure, you know, some subversive committee in Hollywood runs around after you, and anybody who knocks Burke Parks or his dentist immediately gets put on the list. Now this funny Atlantic City, New Jersey uh, ritual, is it Atlantic City? Yeah, that's a concession I make to my sensitivity. I forget things that I don't care for. It presents admittedly beautiful young women doing their thing. And their thing is frequently dancing upside down, uh, some less than memorable dramatic readings, exuding the same kind of talent and sincerity one might find in professional wrestling, uh, or, or the roller derby, or an area or two from uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, delivered with at least gusto, if not always sensitivity, and not always on key. But the major criticism that the whole bloody thing reeks with such blatant naked and predictable commercialism that one almost yearns for a tent medicine show where the hapless victim gets his pocket picked at least without pretension. Now frequently I'm associated with fantasy and science fiction shows like Twilight Zone and Night Gallery. And I'd guess that my own excursions into the imaginative or exercises in stringent reality compared to some of the three think tank offerings that I broached to you this evening. Uh, small fantasy, which I share with you. Uh, when I look at commercials, for example, I begin to fantasize as to what I would do with the commercials to improve or to make them a bit more palatable. And I came up with what I think is a dandy, uh, which I will now share with you. Uh, chap fade on. Chap stands on landing of fourth, uh, fourth floor window way up on the building and he suddenly leaps through the air and lands in the open front seat of a sedan convertible. And uh, my fantasy takes this form that one day this poor bastard will land on a stick shift. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> at which time, at which time he will know the real meaning of Hertz. <laughs> now, uh, Now, I've saved this, uh, this area of comment for the last, only because it's my hope that if anything I've said this evening registers with you, 
this last, you might also carry away with some thought and perhaps with some concern. I speak to you now as simply a concerned American artist. Concerned because I sense a tendency on the part of a segment in federal government that seeks through intimidation and threat to muzzle criticism, control program content in the mass media, and ultimately to coerce commercial broadcasting to surrender its prerogatives of free expression. I call your attention to a particularly ugly little speech delivered a few weeks ago in Indianapolis by one Clay Whitehead, who's the director of the White House Office of Telecommunications Policy. In the course of his remarks, he suggested that the administration would submit legislation to the Congress, holding station managers responsible for the bias, or as Whitehead put it, the, quote, ideological plugola, unquote, whatever the hell that means. Now, this follows, as uh, night must follow day, the previous assaults on the networks by the vice president. And Mr. Agnew has complained about network correspondents who engaged in, quote, instant analysis, unquote, and, quote, by the expressions on their faces, the tone of their questions, and the sarcasm of their responses made clear their disapproval of government policy, unquote. And now we're going to censor people because their lips are too bulbous, their noses are too long, their eyes are too suspicious, their hair is too sparse. Now what Mr. Whitehead and Mr. Agnew apparently are seeking is not objective news reporting. They're not looking, obviously, for neutrality in broadcasting. What they're demanding is pro-bias. They are saying and have said that unless network correspondents, news analysts, or news programs cease being critical of individuals and policy of the federal government, that federal government will hit them in their collective mouths with a club and then gag them. Now, first of all, I think it's absurd to believe that there is constant and consistent criticism of the government on the part of the networks. If anything, I think the newscasts that we've been subject to over the past 15 years have usually been trumpeted reproductions of Pentagon communiques with very damn little analysis attached to them. The newscasts have flatly and dispassionately offered up the body count from the war zone like a statistical Bible. They have dutifully, almost religiously, quoted various officials, offering up claims and counterclaims that have been so damn blatantly devious as to make us blush. And they put them on the screen without disclaimer, without embarrassment, and almost invariably without rebuttal. We've heard claims, rationale, arguments almost rancid in their departure from the truth. And yet here is the Vice President of the United States and a relatively high appointee of the President of the United States telling us that the mass media is in the control of ultra-liberal, snotty little intellectuals who have usurped the public air. And I don't find this attitude political. I find it, by God, paranoid. If the president and the vice president would examine history and see how other administrations fared at the hands of muckrakers, they'd feel positively loved and blessed by contemporary television and the press. Look back to what was said against Lincoln, against Roosevelt, against Herbert Hoover, against the late Harry Truman. And recall, if you will, what the late Mr. Truman said of criticism of men in high places. He said, if you can't take the heat, then just get the hell out of the kitchen. The role of the press, the function of the political analyst, the obligation of the reporter is to second guess, is to call to account the rights and wrongs of foreign and domestic policy, is to turn on the dissecting light of inquiry to keep our officials, if not honest, at least visible and accountable. And now that I've probably managed to alienate a sizable group of you, I'll close with this small philosophic aside. Art. Art in all of its forms should follow a precept that George Bernard Shaw once wrote of drama. He said, and this is the Shavian quote, it is a factory of thought, a prompter of conscience, an elucidator of social conduct, an armory against despair, and dullness, and a temple to the ascent of man.
This, I would hope, might be the slogan of all eyes. Let it entertain, and let it examine and probe some of the desperations of our time. Let it with courage, with wisdom, with restraint, and with compassion. Allow its artists to speak out for what they believe and against that which they disbelieve. Whether it be a painting, a television documentary, a motion picture, or the term paper of a college student. Let it represent all the strata of the spectrum. Let it use whatever language within the bounds of truth and taste to tell it like it is. And don't be afraid to tell it like it is. The Russian poet Yevashenko made this comment. One day posterity will remember this strange era, these exceedingly strange times when honesty was called courage. But remember the reverse side of this coin, if you will, just telling it like it is, is not necessarily art. There's that marvelous line in the play, <clears throat> Butterflies Are Free, when the young director is talking about his production, which encompasses sexual perversion, hard drugs, prostitution, and a catalog of other sleazy 20th century accoutrements. And he defends this as a work of art because these things do exist. And another character in the play retorts by saying to him that, yeah, but so does diarrhea, and I wouldn't pay money to see it. I think in the final analysis, there is a cultural meeting ground between the artist and the audience. This lies in their mutual awareness of the responsibility of man, his art, his writings, his paintings, his statements, his poetry, and his law. Charles Dickens, speaking through one of his characters in The Christmas Carol, said, humanity, humanity is our business, and art, art in all of its forms is expressive of the humanity that Dickens talks about. The artist must convey to his audience that the business of man by God is man, and the audience must in turn acknowledge the fact that it is not enough to feel guilt or remorse or even pity for the condition of some of his fellow men. He must do something about it. And all of us, we have an obligation to do something about it. So long as there is hunger, violence, wars, pollution, and prejudice and inhumanity. It isn't sufficient that someone like myself simply writes of it or that someone like you listens to it. We've got to do something about it. To know and not to care. That, ladies and gentlemen, I believe is the ultimate obscenity. Thank you very much. brought over here with Los Angeles. No, I think we have approximately 20 minutes for wrapping, for talking, for questioning. Now, you're going to have to shout out the questions as best you can because I'm a little hard of hearing, among other things. And the other thing is that I will try to paraphrase your questions so that the others in the back who perhaps haven't heard it will be able to know the essence of your inquiry. And that's about it. No questions? Well, it's been wonderful having this chat with all of you. Yes, sir. Is there some official reaction or is there a group, a counter group in Hollywood or elsewhere who are trying to protect? We're talking in duet now, aren't we? Uh, no, there is no official body, but the networks for the first time in their lives, I think, or at least in the past 25 years, are up in arms. They're fighting them with, I think, a degree of courage that is rare in, in viewing what is, uh, has been historically the attitude of networks who roll over and get kicked whenever the federal government rears its ugly head. Uh, I hope that this shall blow away. Uh, I hope that indeed the federal government will do nothing in the way of a gag or a, an act of suppression. But in truth, there is no official thing. Many organizations have officially made public statements, including the Authors League, the Dramatist League, uh, the Writers Guild of America, uh, have all made public statements uh, battling the government's position. That much they have done but there's been no concerted reactive drive yet. How do I feel about paid television? 
Well, number one, I've never seen it for openers. Number two, my guess is that because it deals with a profit motive, you'd pretty much have the same product that you'd see in commercial television. If they have an opportunity to telecast uh, Leonard Bernstein and uh, Peyton Place, and they know that 71% uh, of the audience prefers Peyton Place and will pay 40 cents to see it, that's what they're going to program. So I don't think it's the answer necessarily or the legitimate response to uplifting the, the, the level of programming. What it might do, though, is make us give us access to some fine major drama of a sizable sweep, legitimate plays or major sporting events. But on a day-to-day -day programming level, I don't conceive of it as being a, a big aid uh, to improve programming. Yes. Is there any help conceivably coming from the Congress in the aid of the broadcaster? Well, I think uh, I'd hate to hang by an earlobe until the Congress of the United States of America gets off its ass and does anything about anything. Uh, I think I wasn't trying to be funny in response. It's simply that you've seen now the Congress in almost supine position doing nothing to what has been the most unconstitutional infringement on congressional rights that we've ever seen. So indeed, if they can't protect their own house, I can't see them going off to protect David Sarnoff in New York City. David Sarnoff, that's an inside joke. David Sarnoff is one of the presidents of NBC, in case you're wondering who David Sarnoff is. It's Joe Sarnoff who plays third base for the Phillies. Good, good field, no hit, remember? Joe, Joe Sarnoff. I'm getting tired, guys, you know that? Yes, young lady. Uh, the first question is, where do I get the inspiration to write some of the things I write? And the second part of the question was, can you record my response? Well, certainly you may. Certainly you may. And then I'm going to see that you get mugged as you get out of the building. Uh, this, the source material of all writers varies from writer to writer, from moment to moment. <clears throat> in my own case, uh, I'm frequently inspired by a social phenomena, a public event, a guy I know, a tragedy that I've observed, a funny, warm, uh, lovely moment, uh, an aura of sweetness that exudes from humans that I've met. This is all grist for the literary mill. Uh, how I sit down and get it down on paper, of course, is a technical thing. In my case, I take it to bed with me and I sweat it for three, four days. I think it was Tom Wolfe who said that writing was the easiest thing in the world. You just put a paper in the typewriter and you look at it and you bleed. And uh, that, in essence, is what the creation of the written word is. Uh, but in truth, uh, to the aspiring young writer, I would say that, number one, write, keep writing. Uh, writing begets better writing. It, be it begets uh, more probing writing. It begets a sense of style, all of this. And what's most important, it also begets a sense of discipline, which is urgent with the writer. You've got to get there and write. You know, even if it's sunny out and it feels nice, why, is something going on over my shoulder? Huh? Oh, thank you, Betty. I thought you were making faces behind my back, Betty. That's been known to happen. No, I'm belaboring this. Uh, but I think the essence here is that, it, that you know, how you're visited by the muse varies tremendously from person to person. And as a young student writer, an aspiring writer, don't be turned off by the fact that it's not easy to sit down and write creatively. The problem with a student, of course, is that he must share that drive with 18 different subjects, a whole hell of a lot of social obligations, a sense of indirection and strangeness that is part of the whole process of maturing, finding yourself, and again, I repeat this over and over again, this is not meant to be condescending or Dutch uncling. The, the maturing process that I'm talking about happens to all of us. But um, I submit to you that when you become a professional writer, that, that kind of competition doesn't exist. All you're doing in life is writing. But you don't have an exam in sociology on Thursday. You don't have a dance date coming up on so-and-so. You don't have a march here. You're right. That's all you do, see? Yes, sir? In the event that I'm re-employed? That's, that's a great preface. Thank you. Thank you, Norman Vincent Peale, for that hopeful remark. How would my future work reflect what? Oh, uh, well, I think if I start doing films, 
I think I'll try to be a little bit more courageous in terms of the themes that I tackle. I'd like to do something, for example, that would be somewhat definitive on my feelings about war and violence, and I'm fast becoming a bloody pacifist, uh, faster than I like to imagine. Is it? Uh, beyond that, I think I'm getting a sense of humor that perhaps I was a little tight about that I didn't have 10 years ago, and it was a little more difficult to survive. Do, do I have protection on this stage? I mean, where the hell is the security police on this campus? Yeah. No, uh, not officially. The only way I know that the current administration is not happy with me or doesn't particularly love me is that during the previous two administrations, my wife and I frequently went overseas at the behest of the State Department on cultural assignments to talk to foreign students and foreign writing groups. And oddly enough, or perhaps not oddly enough, we've received no invitations in the past five years. Now this, of course, leaves us with a sense of being unloved. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, uh, I, I can't argue the point. I don't want to be ragingly partisan in this, uh, in this speech tonight. I'm not, I wasn't paid to deliver a political thesis. Uh, in truth, I'm not a big fan of the current administration, but it's my right now to say that. I offer that to you as a purely subjective point of view. You can certainly disagree with that. Uh, my feeling, of course, is that I think Mr. Nixon looks like he's wearing a Robert Hall suit with a hanger in it, see? And, uh, but... But rather than make cheap Jack laughs like this, it's very easy to knock a president, a public official. That's the easiest thing in the world to do, to get a laugh. Uh, thank God I'm not him. I wouldn't want to be the president of the United States. I wouldn't even really want to be the governor of California, though I thought, uh, I figured if Ron could make it, maybe I could too. I, uh... Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, that's the problem, of course. Uh, number one, it was an, an economic problem, and that there simply wasn't enough money to pay local talent. This is the statement on the part of the regional stations. The second thing is that they didn't want to go to the trouble of local programming because it was more costly to put on than to buy reruns and syndicated feature stuff. So what you saw happen was simply buying up syndicated stuff of the very networks and producing firms that were cut off the air for that hour. So it didn't work out at all. Absolutely. Well, I don't see an answer, to tell you the truth, except, as is so often the case, the level of intellect is dictated by the audience itself. If the audience doesn't buy a product or doesn't watch a show, that's tantamount to kiss, giving it the kiss of death, and it goes off and something better replaces it. An example of this, I know this sounds euphemistic, and I mentioned this in class today, uh, you, the, the notable uh, improvement in the level of motion pictures, I think, is directly attributable to its sense of competition with television. Movies had to get better because they couldn't compete on the same level. If they showed on the screen the same Republic crap that we saw 20 years ago and had to pay a buck and a half for it, they'd go home and see the same thing. So consequently, what you saw was an artistic breakthrough uh, on the part of the cinema. Now, I think the same thing can occur in mass, in mass media television, that when the audience becomes so astute and so intellectually with it and so educated that they won't sit still for Bridgie and Burnett. Bridgie and Burnett, how about that one? That's the way I generally do my Anison commercials, too. Through the teeth, like a small gasp, Bridget and Bernie is what I meant to say. Uh, I think probably uh, the networks are responsive to a concerted intellectual drive on the part of an audience. I think we can see it. You've seen it also in the documentaries, a vast improvement in the techniques and in the areas covered, the thematic areas and approaches of the, of the, of the network uh, documentary filmmakers. This is becoming an art form all in itself. And then the last thing you look for, hopefully, is you, the next group, the people who are gonna come up and do the, the executive work and the, and the writing and the directing and the producing. I think and this is not meant, again, to be either condescending or particularly uh, flattering, the young generation today is so infinitely far better read, so much more with it, so much more articulate, so much more committed 
in most areas than mine ever was that we can't help but see some kind of an emotional re uh, an intellectual response to this in terms of what we see as art form. Yes, sir? Uh, what were the differences that I had with Universal and NBC in terms of making me make a network change? Well, they were myriad and varied and would take about eight hours for me to sit down and I would cry. Uh, but I'll give you an example of one of the hang-ups we had when Night Gallery was canceled. And I've mentioned this several times in the course of the classroom discussion. But when they decided they were going to renew it, they called me in and they said, first of all, it'll be a 30-minute show, not an hour show. And uh, secondly, you will have no more shows like the following. These were the hymns of hate. These were the examples that they thought were the, the most deleterious and the least effective. They're tearing down Tim Riley's bar was one film they didn't want to do again. Uh, the Edward G. Robinson film, The Messiah on Mott Street, they didn't want that kind. Uh, somebody adapted the Conrad short story, Silence, No Secrets, no, they didn't want that kind. And a thing called The Class of 99 with uh, robot students, they didn't want that kind. Well, after they said this to me, I thought, what is it you want, gentlemen? What they wanted was Mannix running through a graveyard. Uh, and my title for that is Mannix Depressive. That's the title I got for that. So in truth, it was, you know, it was a legitimate difference of opinion as to what they thought a show should be. And then 13 leaks later, 13 leaks later, you get that? God, man. Honey, a little too much Novocaine tonight in, the, uh, in that lip. I think what then, it, you know, it, showed, it proved its point that an audience just didn't want to see Mannix, either in drag or any other way. Uh, and consequently, it got canceled. But that was essentially the difference that I had with the network. The way in the back, the green sweater. I think it's a green sweater. Allure. Yeah, you, both hands. Well, I've not seen The Last Tango, and unlike so many millions of people, I refuse to make comment on intellectually what it is or whether it's worthwhile or anything, and until I see it, I just leave not mention it. So many people are talking about it now and taking opinions when they haven't even seen it yet. It's like when they used to censor obscenity in Boston. Uh, there's a famous, a famous quote by a judge who banned Birth of a Nation from Boston. He says, I haven't seen it, but I think it's a pretty dirty film. And that's the comment, that's the level of comment you're getting in The Last Tango. Even if it's obscene, I would, the only difference of opinion, I'm sorry, I'm not letting you finish, go ahead. No, I think the only difference, the level of reaction you have to a film like that is not whether it is good or bad, but is it an art form or is it not an art form? Is it there to, to display obscenity in a pretentious form, or is the obscenity integral in the thesis of the storytelling? How frequently, and I mentioned this earlier this morning, we have a habit of reading vast profundity into pretty banal things. Uh, example, a film by Ingmar Bergman, Close Up Leaf, and I mentioned this as an example this morning. Dripping water, slow motion off the leaf, and everybody says, oh God, the symbolism of the Bergman shot the water dripping off the leaves. You know what that means? Well, what it means is it was raining the day he shot, see? And too frequently we carry with it a strange intellectual pretension about things, and we love because everybody loves. You go to the Museum of Modern Art, and there's a white dot and a black thing and somebody's looking at it sagely and saying, uh huh, that is a painting, that's a painting. Everybody says, yeah, oh Jesus, that's a painting, that's a painting. And then they walk out and they're eating their hamburger and say, what is it? What was that? You know, it's a matador. That's what the hell that is. Okay, I think we got time for about three more minutes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. A writing question. Do I characterize from people that I know or do I make up character things? depends on the character. Frequently, I find myself putting in character traits to totally fictional people, but that, that have taken root from a knowledge of other people. Some dialogue is done that way. Uh, in Requiem for a Heavyweight, which you may not have seen because it's a, becoming obscure now, there's a scene in there where they, where Mesh, the manager, plays cards with Army, the cut man, the trainer, and Army has a habit of, over the minute Gleason threw down, Gleason playing the manager, threw down the card, Mickey Rooney, who played Army, would look at it and say, that's good to know, that's very good to know, and it would drive Gleason out of his mind. I knew a guy who played gin that way. You'd throw the card out, and he'd look at the card, and he'd look at you, and he'd say, ah, that's good to know, that's very good to know. He wouldn't do anything, and you'd die. You want to know, is he going to pick it up, or are you going to go to gin? 
it, this is a small, minor example of the kind of thing you draw from an experience. But as the writer, you can be God. You can literally, in almost totally universal fashion, assess any value judgment you want to a human being, give him any way you want it by way of a speech pattern, give him any point of view, political, social, or otherwise, and it can be valid so long as your character is consistent and so long as you believe it when he says it. Somebody asked Maxwell Anderson, who used to write fairly purple prose in terms of dialogue, but lovely, but lovely language. They'd say, uh, Maxwell, we've never heard people actually talk like that. Why do they talk that way? He says, because I want them to talk that way. That's the playwright responding. Re -re Read Ray Bradbury. Check off some of the Bradbury dialogue. You and I don't talk that way. But when you hear it, you believe it, you are moved by it, sometimes you're totally thrust up by it. But it's beautiful language, and that's the essence of dialogue. Not that whether we use it or not, but do you believe it as it's said? Yes, sir, in the back, standing up, light jacket. Gee, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Could somebody paraphrase that for me, because I'm not hearing. A Death Valley with me and H.P. Lovecraft doing what in the desert together? <laughs> I'm straight, I can't speak for H.P. Lovecraft. I don't know what his uh, thing is, but I, uh, I... I don't think fairly I could be compared to H.P. Lovecraft. Number one, I'm not that solid a craftsman as, as Lovecraft was in his day. And also, he was a consummate, consummately skilled man in a certain given area of storytelling, which was the occult, which really isn't really my bag. But I'm a vast fan of H.P. Lovecraft, who is not really as old. Uh, died, Betty, do you know? Fairly recently, in the 20s or 30s. So he's, though we don't think of him necessarily as a literary contemporary, he's not, a, he's not an ancient Victorian writer by a long shot. We got about five more minutes, team, okay? Yes, sir, young man, blue shirt. Would you say that again? Clockwork Orange. What did I think of Clockwork Orange? I, I was, uh, I enjoyed the film. I felt that I was being cheated a bit and indulged in by Stanley Kubrick because he was trying to make a point about the worthlessness of violence by showing us too damn much violence, and which I thought was a kind of a cheap jack cop-out, really. There were elements of violence which weren't really needed in the film. Uh, Kubrick, who I think is perhaps one of the five best American directors currently walking, brilliant young director, has a habit, I think, of a certain degree of self-indulgence. You can see it in 2001. I think a good 18 minutes could have been well cut out of that film and still had a hell of a classic movie. As it, as it was, it was a brilliant cinematic experience. But my problem with Clockwork Orange, Orange Clockwork Orange, <laughs> God almighty, haven't eaten enough. I mean, that's a problem. Uh, I, I think that I felt oversurfeited with the continuing violence, some of it which was almost too, too much to bear, really. But as an overall film experience, I liked the film. Yes, way in the back. And then, on your right. What are my views on the psychedelic drug experience? Well, it's difficult to make a comment in any kind of depth when I, in truth, have never popped one or stuck it in a vein, and I don't intend to. I have a vast fear of the unknown when it comes to any kind of drug. Now, I know uh, that marijuana is a thing and all that. I'm not making any moral judgments. You do whatever you, what pleases you. Your thing is your thing. Uh, I submit to you, though, that I would like you to know precisely what is the long-term consequence of the usage of any drug before you wildly and with great uh, sense of freedom embrace it as a momentary pleasure. Now, with the, the concept of the artist being somehow stimulated by the use of a hallucinogenic and suddenly opened up vast vistas of creativity and you can write beautiful things because you're under the influence. I think that's crap. Uh, I must tell you that. I don't think anybody can write if he doesn't know who he is and where he is and what he's writing. I don't believe in a Jekyll Hyde concept. I think we are one and our creativity is one and there's nothing, in the, nothing on God's earth that can, in, in a false and artificial manner, uh, somehow enhance the creative process, somehow stimulate it, buddy, from the outside. Yes, ma'am, pink shirt, pink, pink dress lady, pink, pink, pink. I didn't hear you.
Boy, I'm sorry, young lady, I can't hear you. Try again. Do I think something about the consumer does something? Quit beating around the bush. Say what you mean, you know. F feeding this unpalatable stuff, yeah. Ah, you're suggesting, now if I'm incorrect in my reading of this question, is that it's part of a sense of escapism on the part of the audience, this permissiveness to allow networks to feed whatever they want to them. Is that what you're saying? I, in truth, I think there's a kernel of truth. I sense a strange mood of escapism in this country. I think it's number one why, in a, in a special sense, why we relate so to the occult, to fantasy, to stories of imagination. Because maybe it's getting too bloody unpalatable to live on Earth. And we love the idea of programs that defy natural law and put us into haunted houses and in strange places. I think that's part of an escapist feeling that the world, in the immortal words of, I think it's Edna St. Vincent Millay, the world is too much with us. Was it Millay, Betty? It was Milton. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I thought it was Edna St. The world is too. Oh, no, you're right, because Millay said, I, the world is too much, much too beautiful, me thinks. Yeah, that's the Millay line. You'll forgive us while we talk a little poetry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you, you young fellow. Well, the question here is a legitimate one. You ask, uh, what is the conflict between our own federal government and broadcasting when you can offer up as an example of a beautiful working relationship the BBC and Great Britain and the British government? Well, the one thing that the British government doesn't do to its broadcasting is to censor it. It makes no attempt to control the program content of the BBC. It does ask for percentages of time devoted to certain types of things, like music, like drama, like a presentation of the arts. But the BBC can put on any damn thing it wants. Much closer, by way of a relationship, is French government television, which conceivably could be our problem. There, the French government blue pencils every bloody script down to the time announcements. And you dasn't say anything that is remotely critical of government policy in the country of France and French-controlled television. So, you know, let's forget the BBC. Let's worry what's going to happen, what might happen in Washington akin to Paris, that kind of thing. Yes, sir? White t-shirt, white trivial. I said the youth was becoming better read. I'll try to paraphrase that properly. Do I feel that man, in relation to his surroundings, is taking aside technology? All right. All right. Is man improving himself? Yeah, I think essentially that the thrust is upward, that the progress is there to be seen. Uh, apart again from technology. Let's take, for example, and at the, the, the whole business of race relations in this country. This is not to remotely suggest to you that we are now living as one in an aura of sweet brotherly love. But I also suggest that you take a look, for example, at some of the art forms as they existed 25 years ago and what they did to some of the ethnic minorities in this country, what they did to the black American, this kind of thing. And you'll note that man is becoming particularly sensitive to his fellow man. This is a small, really almost a peripheral example of a fairly fundamental thing you're talking about. But I have a very sign, a very hopeful feeling about the condition of man. Don't ask me why, but I do. If I didn't, I'd cut my wrists. Okay, about two more, okay, because I'm losing my voice, yes? What do I think is worth watching on television now? I'm hard pressed to answer because in truth, I watch so little. Uh, my wife and I, my wife to a lesser degree, but particularly I am addicted to the late movies on television. Uh, and as to the current crop of dramatic shows, I see a few of them, and I see some quality. Marcus Welby, on occasion, will do kind of an interesting show. Nothing I want to award a Pulitzer to. But then again, Marcus Welby can turn around and say, what the hell have you done lately, Serling? And I'd be hard-pressed to respond. Uh, well, I've done a couple of Anisons, uh, that kind of thing. I've given eight million American headache by watching that dull uh, commercial. Okay. 
Yes. Say again. What is my present salary from NBC? Well, number one, it's a personal question I don't have to answer, but I can because it's nothing. Uh, so, needless to say, I feel quite free to bite the hand that used to feed me, that kind of thing. Uh, yes, with a cap, a blue cap. Uh, I have a, a fairly unexciting middle-class background. My dad was a butcher, uh, an, an immigrant boy who went to the eighth grade and then, uh, you know, worked with his hands. Very successful butcher. His thumbs weighed 12 pounds, my dad. That's a little joke that Tarzan made. Thumbs on scale, get it? Uh, but my dad was also a very articulate man, though uneducated, and he's, he spawned two sons who became professional writers, my brother and myself. This was in upstate New York, a very small uh, community, and uh, then came the war. Uh, and uh, after serving in, the, in World War II, I came back and went to college, not really knowing what the hell I was going to do with my life, because I went to service very young, and uh, I, I'd really never been a master planner about anything. And writing just sort of, you know, came in through a side door, very fortuitously and gratefully for me uh, that it did come, because I literally couldn't do anything else in my life. You know, I can't, I can't screw in a light bulb without an afternoon rehearsal. I, I can't do anything. I can't sell anything. My God, I'd get locked jaw if somebody says, you know, sell this policy. I, I finally probably wind up telling the guy, look, I think it's cheaper just to die, buddy. That kind of thing. Listen, team, I think we've had a full evening. I want to thank you. Your level of questions have been, I think, quite outstanding, and, and your response has been respectful, even if you didn't agree with what I said. And, and in, in, because I'm leaving tomorrow morning, I must tell you, I don't know if, if any mark has been left on any of the kids that I've talked to, but I can assure you that in response, I've had a ball. I've had a marvelous time, a fruitful one, an enriching one, and I truly hope I'm invited back. Thank you very much.